Hello, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm John Rennie. I'm the editorial director of McGraw-Hill Education's Access Science, and I have the real genuine pleasure today of getting to speak with Simon Monk. Uh, Simon is a well-loved figure within the maker movement and the world of do-it-yourself electronics. He's been the author of more than a dozen books uh, on do-it-yourself projects that uh, we at McGraw-Hill Education have had the pleasure of working with him on. And uh, today, we're going to get to have a conversation uh, really on the subject of, of makerspaces and active learning projects and the relevance of that to the, the world of STEM learning. Um, but I thought I'd really, really, really start off by taking you back to your own origins. Of how okay. did you get started in becoming the sort of tinkerer, builder, inventor that you are? Um, I've always been interested in electronics as a hobby. And um, as, a, as a teenager, um, I was a fairly dull teenager, and I really just I spent a lot of time making little electronic projects. I used to get those. Uh, uh, a magazine uh, in the UK uh, uh, called um, Wireless World and um, it used to have uh, great little projects that you could solder up yourself. I didn't really understand very much about how they work but I used to enjoy getting these magazines and making these little things. So make a, a metal detector that would probably just about detect a car if it was about half an inch under the ground maybe. Not very sensitive <laughs> but they were all, the, you know, the fun was in making them. Um, and then I kind of had a, a career in software as, as so many people uh, do after after university, and um, but I always had electronics as a sort of hobby in the background, and I kind of um, gradually came across Arduino, found these, this accessible microcontroller board that people seem to be using, and then my first book was uh, Thirty Arduino Projects for the Evil Genius, and that's that was really me learning Arduino, and then building my first projects with it. So, and I think actually. When you're learning a new technology, it's not a bad time to write about it because you know all the things that other people don't know, as it were. You know, you're, you're discovering the problems and the gotchas that you can then document so that other people can pick it up more quickly. Right. You're, yeah. you're, you're really there. You're, you're immersed yeah. in the world of the kinds of problems and the, the thought process. Yeah, you can be too have. much of an expert. If, if you're a real expert in a, in a subject, it's quite easy to write a really inaccessible book <laughs> 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 that nobody really understands except you, <laughs> which, of course, isn't going to sell very well and isn't, isn't terribly helpful to the community. Um, so, yeah, I gradually drifted into, into writing. And then um, uh, eventually, one way or another, my career kind of went, uh, I started a business and I sort of drifted away from what was going on with that business and I should have left probably a year before. But <laughs> eventually I sold out to my partner and um, we parted company and I, I took the writing up full time. Wow. So, and it's, uh, you know, love doing it. It's a great way of making a living really. Well, and the world is much richer, of course, for everything that you've done in trying to, to help you kind of introduce <laughs> lots of people. <laughs> you've done so much to introduce people really to this world of, of electronics. It's very and rewarding. It, it, it's lovely when you see comments on Amazon and, and other places where people have said, you know, this is this is great book that's got me started into this technology. Because some, some technologists, and you, you sort of see this with um, I don't really consider myself a proper electrical engineer. I did, I did a fair amount of electronic engineering in, uh, at university, mm -hmm. but I've never considered myself a proper, I've never worked as an electronic engineer. And I think a lot of electronic engineers, uh, they're incredibly thorough people, and they're, inc they're almost diametrically opposed to the maker movement. It's kind of, they start with the theory, and then they work their way up into uh, making things once they've got all of that maths behind it and all of the other things they need behind it. Whereas the maker movement, and, uh, and I think this works in some STEM education as well, kind of starts from the other end. Mm -hmm. They start with making something, and then they backfill with the theory and say, why did we need to do this? Well, this is why you need to do this. Try doing something different with it and see what happens. And Oh, well, I've burnt that out. Okay, well, that's why I need to know Ohm's law. <laughs> right. So rather than it being a case of a load of dry math that you have to learn at the beginning uh, before you can do anything useful, you start with the exciting stuff, and then you work your way back to the the more mundane stuff, but it, it will help you in the long run when you come to try and think of new things to do. That very much seems to be the, the fundamental principle of, of how active learning is supposed to work. That yeah. It builds this kind of natural enthusiasm that people have Absolutely. for the project, and then it inspires them to want to learn more about the underlying theory from there. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the two really fun things in life, I think, are, are learning and making things, aren't they? So, I mean, I think if you can couple them together, you, you will just have no trouble engaging kids. And well, I mean, in your own case, I mean, it, yeah. it's, 
I mean, I just take it that you have, of course, as an adult, a general interest in science and technology yes. and engineering yeah. and the like. But I mean, as as a boy, when you were getting started on these things, did you did you see yourself as being broadly interested in those fields to start with, or did the did the hobby inspire more interest? Oh, a little bit of both. I was <laughs> always interested in science, but I always saw making things electronic as, as more of a craft for me because I didn't understand much about the theory. So what would happen is if I did something wrong, uh, I would kind of be a bit stuck because I wouldn't really know why it wasn't working. I wouldn't know how to debug it with a multimeter or work out well, why is that voltage not what it should be. It was very much, a, you know, if I did it wrong, then <laughs> there was a lot of <laughs> messing about until it either worked or it, or it went in a bin because it wasn't going to work. Yeah, so but it, 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 it certainly helped me a lot, I think, because um, it gave, when, when science in school started to meet the things that I was doing in practice for my own fun, mm -hmm. then it, it, it meshed together. It started to make more sense. I get the impression that what sometimes people who are skeptical about this, this connection between yeah. um, maker, maker projects and STEM education, that, that sometimes they think, well, the maker projects may make the science or technology more fun, but does yep. it really inspire them to learn more about it? What's been your experience? Oh, yes, it does. I, I think it's almost a matter of um, being inclusive. So I, I did a, an Arduino course for the Glasgow School of Art, which was absolutely fascinating because I've never taught artists before. These were people who had not done science subjects uh, at all. They, they were all artists. They were very, mostly very clever people but they hadn't been come from the science and the programming background and so many things that I kind of took for granted. And um, yet yeah, they, they did it in a different way. And some of them didn't care at all how it worked. Quite a lot of them actually, didn't, really didn't care. I just want to make it get this string of lights displaying a, a message or doing something. I want to be able to make a nice glowing effect illuminating this particular piece of art or whatever it was they were interested in. Um, and some of them weren't wanted to know why. And so nobody was excluded because everybody got to make the things they wanted to make. Um, quite often by going straight onto YouTube, finding a video of somebody mm -hmm. <laughs> who'd mm -hmm. done something fairly similar, swiping, you know, or going onto Stack Exchange and swiping a load of text and pasting it into their code with very little understanding of why it was working or not working. But that didn't matter for them. But at least they got a result. Some of them, you could tell, were kind of, well, you know, this kind of program is quite interesting, isn't it? That knowing how this stuff works, actually expressing myself in this new language that will then do clever things and attaching a bit of electronics to it and a bit of magic happens. Yeah. You can see that they were getting into that, into the, into the science and wanting to know why it worked. It yeah. feels like that inclusiveness really works at several different levels and in several different ways. Because yeah. as, you, as you say, on the one hand, you are, you are it's a great example of, of a, a population of people who might not ordinarily think of them themselves as being involved in things with science and technology. Yes. They see a relevance to it. Um, and it works the other way as well, that of course you've got people who maybe they think of themselves entirely as being science oriented yeah. or technology oriented and they suddenly there's an outlet for kind of creative thinking that maybe they haven't thought of and yet yeah. it's something that brings them back to good problem solving. So. It, it's all really relevant. It, it shows all of those kinds of connections between the science, the technology, and other interests that yeah, people have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it works well for kids as well. So if you've got a class full of um, children of mixed ability and mis mixed interest in the technology, they can all achieve something. They can all make something. And then the ones that are really into it and the ones that really want to know why will you know, they will dig in, they will find out yeah. uh, how well, this works. And if nothing else, I mean, what we've seen so often is that the numbers of, of children who start off so interested in, in science and then yeah. get at some point turned off to it. And, we, and it's, the, yeah. it's particularly bad when we look at girls who seem to be just as enthusiastic about it when yeah. they're younger and at some point something tells them that science and technology, this is not something for them. Yes, I, I, think, I think it's a terrible shame that that happens, and, it, and society is poorer for it yeah. all around, I think. And I think uh, it, it's sort of incumbent on people who are looking at this technology and trying to sort of spread STEM out into the, into the world. Don't produce 
entirely male oriented <laughs> kits of components that it's seen as a, a macho I'm doing macho soldering things together <laughs> whereas you can actually have have a bit of fun and I think make uh, at the very least sort of gender neutral sort of kits and things for, for, for people to use uh, I think it's um, it's important well, let's actually just try to, to like drill down to a, a slightly more specific level. So mm. let's say that you know, if, if there's a teacher someplace who wants to try to inspire students to learn more about, let's say, physics concepts, yeah. are there particular types of projects that would be best suited for doing that, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think um, it depends on the si what side of physics, I suppose. Mm -hmm. the, the, kind of at, at that level, physics is either sort of mechanical engineering to some extent, isn't it, or it's electronic engineering, okay. maybe. So I think there are um, projects that have an immediate result that you can see something happening, and I suppose something like a, a robot rover that you mm -hmm. can move around, uh, where you're learning a little bit about gears, because you could just try connecting the motor to the wheel and see what happens, nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you think, ah, actually I need to, and then you can talk about torque and introduce loads of topics relating to the physics of the movement. Um, and then from an electronics point of view, you can say, well, I need a, a transistor to amplify the power so that I've got enough energy going into those motors to turn them. Um, yeah, I mean, a, an interesting, we've, um, I've got a, a, a business developing kits for things that sort of kind of go along with the books and, or not necessarily the books, just kind of educational kits for use with Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Um, so w one of the ones we've done recently is um, actually for a, a puppet, a, a marionette type thing. So it's just four servo motors, but then you have, um, you've got little arms and then you've got these are attached to the strings. But there again, you sort of introduce concepts. Uh, we, we don't do any of this uh, in terms of <laughs> useful material. We kind of just dump it on the teacher, on the educator really. <laughs> but uh, you, can, you can learn about uh, you know levers, and you can learn about what, what, why can't I have a really long stick and then the string on the end? Well, you know the torque is going to be a problem, and you're going to strip the gears on the on your little servo motor. And things. Oh, so we've seen this a lot with people who yeah. have like robotics clubs everywhere. Okay. So like great demonstrations of, of kind of principles of what seems like a simple problem of like I want yeah. a robot to be able to do this. But it does introduce them to a world of different physical issues of just how strong does the motor have to be? What kind yeah. of gearing do you need? You can learn an awful lot about from a, a simple project that goes wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you want to know why it doesn't work. You want to know what, what well, what do I do? Uh, even things like um, how long the battery is going to last. Mm -hmm. And if, if you can, if you can th this is the magic of maths, really, that you can introduce it. So you can say, well, I want to know how long the batteries are going to last. One way is to power up the robot and drive it for 20 hours and see if the batteries go flat. The other way is to do a little bit of a sum and kind of work out. Mm. And then, OK, well, maybe we actually test uh, hypothesis C, but how long they work. So I think it, it isn't just sort of introducing sort of physics ideas and things and science ideas. It's also shows the relevance of math because so many kids get completely turned off math because they think it's just a completely abstract, irrelevant subject, whereas actually it's, it's a way of making magical predictions about what's going to happen in the real world, right. which is inc an incredibly powerful tool. And um, it's very closely coupled to certain kind of, of logical thinking that ties in with like programming, which yeah. is obviously very relevant to the sort of electronic projects, and it's hugely useful for, for the different sorts of things. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, really, uh, you can't really do much in the way of I, 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 sort of working on um, a book where I'm looking at lots of different uh, electronic, a very broad electronic book. And you sort of come to the conclusion that a really large chunk of this happens with microcontrollers. There's an awful lot of sort of this, you know, where you would have in the past have used discrete digital chips to make things. You just don't. You just have a microcontroller and a few transistors. That's kind of it. So then you, you're moving the focus away slightly from the hardware towards using software to do what you would in the past have done with hardware, uh, which is interesting as well. I, I, in my mind, I'm just ticking off the number of different uh, occupationally relevant skills that we've just discussed, even just in the last yeah. couple of minutes. I mean, different things in areas of, of engineering and programming, um, different kinds of electronics uh, yeah. design. Um, and you know, really, just there's, there's no shortage of skills that people can, can pick up through these different sorts of, of maker projects. Absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, not, not even, that's even just within this, this 
relatively restricted area of different types of projects. The larger yeah. maker movement connected yeah. with so many other kinds of things that people are doing with 3D printers and the like yeah. and uh, other, other kinds of, of instruments. So it's really any number of dis different sorts of industrial, industrially relevant skills can yeah, be Yeah, absolutely. Out. I mean, there's tool, using tools. Again, this is another thing. You know, it's not just learning the technology. It's actually the practical skills of how, how do I solder? How do I... Uh, uh, how do I do laser cutting? How do I do 3D printing to make things? These are all manufacturing technologies that people can learn from this, uh, this technology. Mm. So where do you see the maker movement going, particularly with respect to uh, the educational applications to STEM uh, and, and this, this sort of active learning? Yeah, um, I think that, that they will get closer and closer together. I mean, you, you see this is something I'm incredibly impressed with, with the American system of where, where so many libraries are actually including maker spaces and maker uh, areas in, within, their, within their, their, their buildings. This is something that is not happening at all in the UK. We do have maker spaces, but they're very much a separate place from public libraries. They're, they're not so much a public engagement sort of area. You get a lot of people who are already um, who are in the maker movement, but they're kind of um, almost professional makers. Huh. It's, it's not as much a, a, a public thing as, as you seem to be getting over here. And, and I think that's really good because libraries really kind of bridge the gap between the out and out maker who just wants to make something and education. Because right. the library sits in the middle, you will get people coming in from schools, you'll get, they, they will organize the classes and things like that will, that will engage kids to learn how to use this kind of thing. So I think I, I would like, you know, I think you're, do, you're doing that well over here and I, I would love to see that happen more in the UK where, where it starts to be a, you know, um, you get that crossover, you get almost a librarian mediating what's going on with the wild makers and what's going on with education and kind of bringing the two together. And of course it's the great value especially of, of the public libraries, of being a, a kind of, of leveler or equalizer, that it does mean that, that yeah. people who might not ordinarily have access to certain kinds of tools, uh, yeah. like suddenly they, they do have some level of access and they can play on a little more level yeah. playing. Provision of tools is, is absolutely key to it because people will always find something to do. If, if you show somebody a laser cutter and what it can do and show them the software and show how you basically draw what you want to cut out and then press the button and then a little bit more to it than that, but so long as somebody's standing by with a fire blanket or whatever, just in case. But yeah, you, people will think of things they can do with it. And um, you, I think provided, I, I saw a wonderful statistic about um, electric drills, that the, everybody has an electric drill hmm. in their house. And the average use of an electric drill over its lifetime is something like five minutes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has one. <laughs> you don't really need your own. <laughs> so you have a, a you know a well equipped public area where you can come and use all these tools. A, you're making very efficient use of the tools, but B, you're providing what would otherwise be inaccessible tools because not everybody can afford a laser cutter or, an, or, or a, a 3D printer that works properly. You can, there's lots of cheap 3D printers, but most of them don't really work very well. So I think it's um, provision of tools, absolutely key to it. Mm. I, I never would have dreamt that electric drills actually might get less use than the average rowing machine in people's <laughs> homes. <laughs> no, much less, I think, yeah. <laughs> so if you would, tell, me, uh, tell me a little bit about your latest book, Programming FPGAs, uh, and what, yeah. what inspired you to ro work on this? Well, um, FPGAs, Field pro Programmable Gate Arrays, are um, they're, they're, they're just a, a magic piece of hardware in a way, because we're, we're used to using microcontrollers where you have fixed hardware and you write a program to tell it to do something and control input output pins or whatever. Um, An FPGA is configurable hardware. Um, so it's made up of a whole load of logic cells and you write a, in a hardware description language, you say how you want those logic cells to be connected together and how those logic cells should behave. And then um, you do that from your PC and you press a button and it, and it downloads that configuration onto this um, FPGA chip that can then behave in that way. And you can even take it to the extent that you'd actually program the FPGA to act like a microcontroller and then program the microcontroller, which is completely uh, mind bending really. But um, these are available on prototyping boards that, uh, that you know, just uh, to, to play with. So for little more than the cost of an Arduino, I think the cheapest one's probably sort of $40, 40 or $50, mm -hmm. for which you could get a sort of little seven-segment display, the FPGA chip itself, 
um, usually a video output socket, a VGA uh, socket as well, because one of the things about FPGAs is because you're defining your own hardware, you can, you can write very fast. You can, you can make it behave much more quickly than if you're trying to bash bits out to create a, a VGA signal from software, because you're, you're implementing it in the hardware. Um, there's a few uh, sort of boards that are quite popular with amateurs. Uh, there's the Papilio and the Mojo. And um, I do all the examples for those two books, but I also do them for another board, which is um, uh, called the Albert II. Uh, from a, a place called Namato Labs. They're actually an Indian company, but it's, it's a very good value board, and it's um, actually very well documented and quite easy to use. So really the idea was that there's all these different boards, and it's quite difficult to really get started with it. There, there are tutorials out there, but they tend not to kind of give you the whole story or take you all the way. So really the motivation for the book was that this is an area that's fun to get into, it's fun to play with because you, you can configure this hardware to do some, do whatever you like pretty much. Um, but there's quite a lot of resistance to getting into the technology. So it's very much a tutorial book. Um, it concentrates on what is the most difficult aspect of it, which is writing this hardware description language. And the hardware description I lang language I use is Verilog. There's a, there's a couple of different ones. Um, so, so rather like the, uh, I've got a few books in the sort of um, Tab McGraw Hill um, programming the X, so programming the Raspberry Pi, programming the Arduino, and it was really to take the same kind of approach. So start really, really simple, and then just gradually build on the earlier examples and work up to introduce this topic that is quite often seen as the reserve for professionals. Uh, I mean, you know, professional electronic engineers will use FPGAs in all sorts of things from guided missiles to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it gets used a lot in avionics and things like that. Um, uh, and it's sort of the way that electronics is going to some extent. So I know Microsoft looked, I think it's Microsoft have started including FP, an FPGA almost just for the sake of it oh. within their big server farm, for the, their server modules for their server farms, oh. so that they've got that option to configure the hardware a bit differently if they want to. Interesting. Yeah, um, so I'm not sure they, oh, I think they, I think they did use it to, uh, for Bing to improve their search algorithm, oh. so, or, or to run it more efficiently, because they can implement, you can implement entire algorithms in, in you know, uh, in hardware. So, for example, in the early days, Bitcoin miners were quite often implemented as FPGAs mm. to get the performance hit. These days, people use just custom chips for Bitcoin mining and things, uh, and the returns are obviously diminishing. It's hardly worth it. Um, yeah, so it's really to try and get people started on using FPGAs. I have to be perfectly honest, for the maker, it's more about the fun of learning to use them sure. and to make a simple project. A lot of the time, you don't really need them. You, you would be quite just better off using a, an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, really. But I think it's just that one of those things that's really interesting to learn if you're interested in to want to learn a new, new technology and a new way of doing things. Well, it, it sounds like it's part of, you know, we've been talking about this idea of sort of this progression of people acquiring interest that turn yeah. into knowledge and then skills. And this sounds like people who've developed an enthusiasm for this kind of programming and the things you can do for it. This yes. is a way of graduating onto a different sort of practically relevant device with which to be able to do use such yeah. things. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. I wish you obviously a lot of luck uh, with the book. And we're Thank very, you very much. Very grateful that you were able to spend some time <laughs> with us today to talk about this. Um, okay. Anyone who would want to know more about Simon's uh, uh, vast archive of work <laughs> at this point, um, certainly I would direct you to his website, which is drmonk.com. That's D O C T O R M O N K uh, dot com. Um, you are also, if you subscribe to Access Engineering, you can find most of his books in the Makerspace section of that. And if you are a subscriber to Access Science, uh, my baby, then uh, you are uh, also, I can steer you there to uh, the projects area where you'll find several of his projects. We're very glad to be able to feature them there as well. Simon, thank you so much for taking the time with speaking. You're, you're welcome. Lovely thank to you. talk to you. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>